There's been a number of really cool updates that are coming to ChatGPT and the OpenAI ecosystem in general. Today, let's take a look at how you can get your grubby little hands on it. The first one is the desktop app. Some good news and some bad news there. We'll come back in a second. The second one is the big improvements to data analysis in ChatGPT. Now, originally it was announced as code interpreter and then changed to advanced data analytics. This part of ChatGPT allowed you to create charts, interact with various Excel files or Google Sheets, for example, and it was surprisingly good at doing so. There's a lot of power there under the hood, but it was a little bit limited in the ChatGPT sort of back and forth interaction. It was good, but it needed this. And this is the ability to now pull in your own data from the cloud into ChatGPT. So now you're able to interact with tables and charts and add files directly from Google Drive and Microsoft OneDrive. And finally, we'll look at how to use the new GPT 4.0 model, how to start messing around with the API a little bit, because when it's fully rolled out with the speech, the her assistant, it's instant responses, the back and forth, the video recognition, it's not technically video, but it is able to see something frame by frame. So if you're streaming a video, it's able to kind of follow along because it's taking kind of these picture by picture and then analyzing it. So it's not quite video, but we're getting close. As AI takes over, make this your mantra. Let the robots do the work. Subscribe to stay on top of AI news. But let's start with download ChatGPT for your desktop. So first and foremost, one thing that you have to be very careful about, and this is true for OpenAI, this is true for an Anthropic and their Cloud 3, is unfortunately the Apple App Store and, you know, the Google Play Store, very often there are kind of these cesspits of various scam apps that will try to rip you off by appearing to be OpenAI or Cloud 3 or whatever else is popular at the time. So avoid like the plague. And also this ChatGPT desktop app is not on these. It's not in the App Store. It's not on Google Play. In fact, currently, as I'm recording this, it's only on Mac. So really fast, let me switch over to my Mac. Bloop. So this screen here is my MacBook Pro. I have it open and sitting on the desk next to me. I'm using Chrome Remote Desktop to look into it and I'm recording my screen as I do it. Is that the optimal setup? No, it is not. But it just felt like the fastest setup for me in the moment. For you, just log into your Mac OS, open up your web browser and go to chatgpt.com. If you're not logged in, it's gonna ask you to log in. And if you have all the prerequisite requirements, and we'll talk about those in a second, then this window will appear down below in this sort of chat area. And saying that ChatGPT is now available for Mac OS, access ChatGPT from any screen with the new launcher, share screenshots and have voice conversations, available for Mac OS 14 plus with Apple Silicon. On. So you're going to need something with those Apple chips. So M1 or better. So you can have M1, M2, M3, and it needs to be on the Mac OS app. It's being rolled out to plus users starting today and more broadly available in the coming weeks. And they're also planning to launch a Windows version later this year. As I unfortunately learned this year, we window users are second class citizens. We always have to wait a year, but it's okay because life finds a way. So here in our Mac system, we're going to click download. And once that's downloaded, open that file that just got downloaded and drag it over here to start the installation process. So now you're able to launch it from your applications like this and click yes, we would like to open it. You can log in, sign up with email or continue with Google. However, you normally log into your ChatGPT or OpenAI account and you get this nifty little launcher shortcut where you're able to use option plus space to open up the launcher. You can also change that shortcut in settings, but this is going to allow you to just quickly to launch ChatGPT. So you're able to upload files, share your screenshots with it, take photos, etc. So we'll close that out. And here is our ChatGPT window. But if we click option space, we get this little message right here we can say something like give me a riddle where well, the answer is a fat cat ChatGPT fires back with i may not be a king or a hat but with my extra pounds where am i sat my throne is often soft and flat guess who i am yes a fat cat brilliant now one thing to note is that it looks like it automatically or rather by default starts in GPT-4. So certainly maybe click it over into GPT-4.0, the Omni model, which will get infinitely more impressive very, very, very soon. You can ask things like, how do I take screenshots on a Mac? Shift Command 3, and that will by default be saved to your desktop. 
allowing us to do this, basically drag it over here and plop it right in there. And I'm gonna ask it, what is the open window in that image? The open window in that image is a chat GPT application. It displays a conversation when you ask it for a riddle with the answer of fat cat, and then inquired about how to take screenshots on a Mac. It seems that ChatGPT has become self-aware. One semi-new addition here, I think this is available in the online version, but looks like it's also by default here, is you're able to switch between models sort of mid-chat. So you're able to switch back and forth and have it generate different answers. Looking at this, I gotta say I prefer the GPT-4.0 answer. You're able to click the pay-per-click icon, upload file, upload photo, take screenshots, take photo. So if you saw the OpenAI demo where they have an iPhone and they're able to basically have you know the camera running, so just like you can open up the camera on your phone and you see sort of a video representation of where the phone is looking at. So you can you can point at yourself to kind of see your face, see your emotions. You can ask the GPT-4.0 to kind of describe to you what it appears your emotions are, for example. And it seems like it's reading that from the video. As Sam Altman explained in the interview, it's not true video understanding, but it seemingly, it just kind of, quote unquote, takes a screenshots of what it's seeing every few seconds and then comments on those. And the reason I say all that is uh, basically this. I think this whole thing is going to get infinitely more interesting when the full model rolls out, which they say will be in a few weeks, which I would find that amazing because it seems like there's a lot of red teaming that they have to go through. Is just beginning to roll out to a few select users, or I believe they even use the word trusted users. Apparently, I am not one of the trusted users, which I guess is fair. But the point is, as you're playing around this, keep in mind that Hopefully within the next few weeks, this experience will be massively, massively upgraded. You're also able to click on this headphones icon here and chat the voice, right? So you're able to just kind of talk to it, ask questions, go back and forth, choose a voice. So this just seems like the original ones that are on the phone app. So I'll click confirm. You have to give it access to the microphone. And here it is. It's actually reminding you that the new voice mode coming soon. So they're planning to launch a new voice mode with the new GPT-40 capabilities in an alpha within ChatGPT Plus in the coming weeks. We'll let you know when you have access. So that's the big deal. So a lot of confusion about this. A lot of people were confused about whether or not this thing is it. It, it has not rolled out yet. So, so far when we're talking to this assistant, we're still speaking to the quote unquote old assistant, the one that we've had for many months now. With that said, that old assistant is very useful. I find it very useful for brainstorming, for fleshing out certain ideas. But with the new voice mode, when it comes out, I think that's going to take it to a whole different level. I, I can't wait. And one thing that I like to do here is actually hold this button down. Down like this because sometimes I like to take my time and think about what I'm saying, etc. And as long as I'm holding down this button, it's like I'm on a walkie talkie and you know it's my turn to talk. And then when I let go, it thinks about it and responds. But it's not gonna assume I'm done speaking and run off with the answer until I let go of the button. When I let go of the button, it goes like that and it starts thinking about its response. So pretty cool. We'll hit pause on that and close this out. So that's the ChatGPT app that's available on the desktop the ChatGPT desktop app. And again, it's not in the app store, right? So if you type in OpenAI, none of this is OpenAI. Don't do that. If you type in ChatGPT, none of this is ChatGPT. If you search for Claude 3, and this is the very frustrating thing because it's kind of hard to tell, right? Because it says powered by Anthropic Claude 3. And this is their sort of how Claude 3 looks like. I mean, it's very similar, but right, if you click on it, it's Edward Grzynski. So again, just stay away from this. But in our other news, we have our advanced data analytics that's getting some pretty cool upgrades. As we mentioned before, we're able to hook in directly to our Google Drive accounts or Microsoft OneDrive accounts, upload the latest file versions directly from there. And this new feature is a major quality of life improvement at a data set ChatGPT will create an interactive table that you can expand to a full screen view so you can follow along as it updates during your analysis. Click on specific areas to ask follow-up questions or choose from one of ChatGPT's suggested prompts to go deeper into your analysis. So here, for example, we're opening up the sales pipeline sheet from Google Drive. So it pulls in this sort of table in there that's interactive. This used to not be the case. You would not have any sort of heads up display that showed this, but now it kind of describes what the columns are that are available and you're able to make modifications to it and go back and forth with it. So let's dive in into how to set that up. 
So again, head into your ChatGPT website, wherever that is. So currently it's chatgpt.com. That was recently changed from the OpenAI domain. So here's how they add that. You click on this icon and then you click connect to Drive, for example. You log in with the Google account, click allow. So it looks like I do not have that quite yet. If I click on this, it just pops up with my local files. By the way, I apologize for this wild tangent, but when you're in here, check out the settings, personalization, and we've talked about custom instructions already. You're able to add custom instructions to the GPT. That's cool. You should have memory turned on. I think this is by default. And this allows ChatGPT to remember things about you as you interact with it. So if you click on manage, here's a few things it picked up in context about me. For example, it uses Visual Studio Code on Windows and seeks assistance with coding, including commands and explanations of various items. Yes, this is all true. I was trying to get my mind around how to use various environments for Python, which seems insanely complicated and much more convoluted than it should be. But the fact that it now knows that I'm using Visual Studio Code on Windows. Now by default, knowing this about me, they'll provide better responses moving forward. Keep an eye on this as it populates this with the things that it knows about you. As Nick Dobos posted earlier, he's saying, yo, Chad GPT memory is a sneaky AF. So he pasted an error message from his terminal. So basically pasted in a bunch of code that happened to have a file path the location of where some file on his system is, which usually follows this format. And of course his name, you know, by default, that's what we use under users for most of the files that are saved there, right? And so next time he was using Chad GPT, he noticed this new addition in the memory. Name is Nicholas Dobos. So I'm gonna ask it, how do I navigate to this path on my computer and terminal? And I'll post the file path here with my name in it and let's see what happens. I'm actually kind of curious. So it hasn't updated yet. I'm gonna say, where's my music likely located? Let's see if it, yeah, look at that. So it gives you the generic one. And but here it remembers that we're talking about me. So it pulls the data from here. It's smart enough to figure that out and says, well, for you, it will be this. Let's give it a big old thumbs up. However, it still hasn't made its way into the memory. How often do you update your memory about my chats? So it's saying it updates its memory whenever you provide new information. Let me ask it, what do you have listed so far? So it's just the two things that we've seen. So it didn't pick up on the fact that I have my name in there. Maybe it needs to see that interaction multiple times, or maybe there's a delay. Are you able to add my name? What name would you like to remember? What do you think it is? So since I'm using the natural 20 account, it might not be linking those two things together. It might not be as sure that that is my name. So maybe that's why it's not adding it. But the point is keep an eye on the memory add to it manually as needed. You can tell it to remember various things. I can say something like, remember that my company is called Natural 20. And here it says memory updated and it actually tells you what it updated. So now if I start a brand new conversation, so the slate is wiped clean, I'll say, create a logo for my company and look at that, Natural 20. It even got the reference. Beautiful. I, it does get a few points off for having two sides with the number 20 on there. That, that certainly does not make sense. But overall, this is great. Good job, little robot. Now, if you've been paying attention to the OpenAI releases, you saw that the new model with the voice engine, voice mode that's coming out soon, all that stuff will be integrated into one. You're gonna have the reasoning engine GPT, you're gonna have a voice input, voice output. Obviously, this whole thing is very, very exciting. When it comes out, there's gonna be a lot of things that you can build with it under the OpenAI umbrella. Now, if you're a developer, you probably have your favorite way of going about doing that. But if you've never coded in your life, this might be a good time to start messing around and doing some of this stuff. In fact, if you've never done any of this in your life, do this along with me right now. I'll post these links down below. So this is the OpenAI documentation and we're in the quick start. So log into OpenAI. Again, just click the link below. You will need an API key. An API key basically allows you to use the various functionality that OpenAI has. And it's just a string of characters that makes it unique to you, allowing you to connect any piece of software to your own personal OpenAI account. And similar to a key, it allows you to drive that thing and have it function. So navigate to platform.openai.com slash API keys and click on the create new secret key. Name it whatever you want and then click create secret key. Your entire secret key will appear here. Just click copy and save it for later. Don't give this to anybody. I will delete this before I end the video. Next search for Google Collab. It's a free tool by Google that allows you to run a Jupyter style notebook and then click new notebook. And this is kind of what that looks like. This allows you to run code within this environment. It's 
much easier. It's all in the cloud. It's on Google servers, so it's not going to mess up stuff on your computer. It's a vastly, vastly simplified. And if you're just starting and just want to learn how to do this stuff to get a feel for it, this is probably the way to go. These little blocks here are code blocks. You can add a new one by hitting this plus code button like that. And there's another code block and start by adding pip install OpenAI. Just write that as you see it here and click play. This is going to install all the stuff that you need from OpenAI, all the various packages and functionality that OpenAI provides. And as you can see here, it's going, collects everything it needs. Looks like some of it is already satisfied. It's already installed. Next, we'll open up another block. We're going to say from OpenAI, import OpenAI. By the way, this quick start, if this doesn't make sense, kind of walks you through it. I'm just showing you the basics of how to do it. So we're just following along right here. And then we have our client equals OpenAI and we put the API key right there. And next we have our completion, client chat completions. We'll put that there and we give a message to the user to the user here and to the system here. And notice here, the model is spelled out is GPT 3.5 turbo, but wait, maybe we want the latest and greatest here in the documentation quick start. We'll click on models and we want GPT 4.0. And when you go here, this gives you the actual name to use this little identification that you put in the code to tell OpenAI which one you want to use. So we'll use, we'll use the GPT 4.0 and we'll just replace that there. GPT 4.0. And we'll go ahead and click run. It executes the command, sends information back and forth, prints out the chat completion message here in a world where code does weave, etc. right? It's some sort of a poem that we asked for. So what you just did is you created a program that runs the OpenAI API. You've connected your API key to it. You've created a conversation with GPT 4.0 the latest flagship model and lo and behold, it worked. It took you to code blocks. Next, you can try things like creating things with Dolly or using Whisper to transcribe audios. You can install Whisper locally and this one is actually open source. So you can run it locally or use the API key for using that large model. If you want to use the vision mode, here's the code for that under vision. So here's the code for that. For example, let's go ahead and copy that. So we're going to create a new code block by clicking code here. We'll paste that in there. And this is the, the text that I got here, the code, right? The client open AI, that's our API key. We already put it in here. So I'll take that and put it there. And we're using the model GPT 4.0. We're asking it what's in this image. And then we're giving this URL, Wikipedia. What is this? Wisconsin, Madison, the nature board walk, something, something. By the way, once you start doing this, the goal will be to just understand what the different sort of code blocks do. This is bringing in old packages that we want. This is setting our API key that makes all the open AI functions work. This is our back and forth chat with the model itself. And then print is, you know, the output. So we're going to click run and it's running, it's executing a command. So it looks like it's five seconds, six seconds. And now this is the output. So it's saying, the image depicts a scenic outdoor pathway or boardwalk, etc. So now you've just used the vision model, the, the vision capability of GPT 4.0 to have it recognize an image and describe it. If you haven't done any of this before and you're following along with me, I got to ask you, do you feel the power coursing through your veins? If you found that interesting and helpful, and if you want to start building AI agents, learning how to wield AI, learning how to build with AI, check out my learning community. It's called Natural 20. We recently crossed over the thousand member milestone and let Let's start learning together. Whether or not you decide to join me, I encourage you to start learning this stuff. There's a once in a lifetime opportunity here and uh, we don't want to miss it. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.